Uh, well, it's wonderful to get to be in here with you this morning. Uh, I had a fantastic time with our kids in the nursery uh, last week. And uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't get this, this pitch last week, let me give it to you today. Um, it is our hope that as a community, as a family, um, that we would uh, share in the opportunity to know and love our kids. And so we've said multiple times that if you are able, we would love for you to be in the nursery, even if it's once a year. Uh, and so that that's clear that that applies to, to everyone. Um, the moment <laughs> Carrie finds out that I'm not preaching, she puts me right on that schedule. Um, but I hope if you haven't served in there, you might consider it. Um, it's such a gift, and it's a blessing. Uh, yeah. Pastor David, thanks, man. Thanks for, thanks for your word last week. Thanks for the way you encouraged us and challenged us. And um, I'm excited to pick up where you left off and to, to keep walking through uh, this, this fascinating book together. Um, to get us started, what I want to do is uh, we give out a, a daily worship guide every week. So you get this, it's in your worship folder. Um, I know that the Thursday night small group has been using the daily worship guide together for their small group time. I think some others might have as well. Um, what I want to do to get us started this morning is I want to give some of you a chance um, just quickly to share something um, of your time in the daily worship guide this last week. And let me sort of, for everybody who hasn't taken a look at it, give you an idea of what, what I'm talking about. Um, this week, we were considering what are the sources of wisdom outside of the church, outside of scriptures, um, that God has used to reveal his wisdom to us. Um, wh where, where have you been surprised by uh, wisdom coming to you because it maybe didn't come in the scriptures or it didn't come from another Christian? And, and so um, does anybody have an answer that they would like to share? Okay, so from, for, from some teachers. Uh, hmm. Yeah, from younger people, uh, that takes some humbling uh, to, to set aside some pride to be able to hear that. Um, cool, thanks. Who else? Some surprising places where wisdom has come to you. Yeah, Whitney. Hmm. That's cool. Um, Whitney's boss, uh, when, she, when she quit her job, had some, some real wisdom for her um, that she was surprised by. Cool. Yeah, Judy. So, so the wisdom that comes from, from suffering, um, sometimes health things and, and other things that really stretch you and challenge you. Thanks, Judy. Anyone else? So sometimes it's just waiting a little bit longer than, than, than you normally would have for some, for some wisdom to come. Yeah, this is good. Wisdom, wisdom often comes from, from so many different places. And, and I, and I want to get, get us started this morning um, by, we're covering the last two chapters of the book of Proverbs, but to start us, I want to go all the way back to the beginning um, for just a minute. So chapter one, verse one of Proverbs. We read this intro to the whole book. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. This book uh, the entire book of Proverbs, um, all 31 chapters are summarized in this single incomplete sentence. This, this opening line tells us that every line in this book is the wisdom and instruction of King Solomon given to us in the form of these, these simple Proverbs, which are short, memorable, wise sayings. This is pretty straightforward, right? Book tells us this is what, what we're looking at. Solomon, the great king, prayed to God for wisdom and God turned around and made Solomon the wisest man in the world. 
In fact, the scriptures tell us that, that Solomon was so wise in all of his wisdom that rulers from all over the earth would come to listen to his wisdom and that they would come to praise him for his wisdom and that they would heap treasures on him out of their just sheer gratitude for this wisdom that he would, he would share with them. The book of Kings tells the story of the queen of Sheba who came to Solomon in this way. So God is the source of all wisdom. God has given extraordinary wisdom to Solomon. And then Solomon dispenses wisdom as people come to him seeking it, at least during his life. But at some point after his death, some group of people collected Solomon's wisdom into a single anthology. The book of Kings tells us that, that Solomon in his lifetime wrote more than 3,000 Proverbs, which tells us that this book, the book of Proverbs, it doesn't even come close to being an exhaustive collection of Solomon's uh, wisdom. Instead, we would call the book of Proverbs representative of Solomon's wisdom. So like, think of a representative anthology of any other writer, of Mark Twain, of James Baldwin, of Shakespeare, of Amy Tan. This, this collection wouldn't include everything that these, these authors wrote. Rather, a collection would include a selection of their writings that the, the person gathering them thinks are the most important for learning about this, this author. So a representative selection of Solomon's wisdom has been collected into these 31 chapters that makes up the book of Proverbs. They are not the total wisdom that God gave to Solomon, but they represent the total wisdom that Solomon received from God and then passed down to Israel the wisdom of Solomon. I think it's important for us to <coughs> understand what the book of, of, of Proverbs is so that we can experience Proverbs closing chapters, chapters 30 and 31, the way that they are meant to be experienced. So notice this. Chapter one, verse one, where we just started. These are the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Chapters one through nine then are this series of sermons and speeches calling hearers to trust and follow Solomon's wisdom. Pastor David then introduced us to, to the middle section, large middle section of this book, starting in chapter 10. And if you turn to chapter 10, where it begins, you discover this heading, this introduction to this section the Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, this is where the short, memorable phrases are all listed one after the other forever until chapter 29. Chapter 25, if you flip with me through your Bibles, chapter 25 begins, verse one. Um, this chapter shows us that this book is a collection of Solomon's best hits and that the book actually came together in the form we have it way later than Solomon's life. So chapter uh, 25 verse one says, these also are Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah copied. Hezekiah was king hundreds of years after Solomon. And yet he was considered a son of Solomon because in, in Hebrew, to be the son of is to be the descendant of. But he was not just a son by birth, also son in spirit. Because Hezekiah is one who submitted to the wisdom of God, especially as that wisdom came to him through his spiritual father, Solomon. And then we get to our passage this morning, chapter 30. So flip there. Follow along with me as I read. The words of Agur, 
Who? Oh, son of Jake. That, that auger totally clears it up. The oracle. <laughs> these are the proverbs of Solomon, and yet these are the words of some rando named Agur. Like, this is weird. But then we turn to the next in the final chapter, chapter 31. Chapter 31, verse 1, the words of King Lemuel. Oh, yeah, 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 King, King Lemuel. You remember him right from, oh, that's right, nowhere. Right, we've never heard of this guy before anywhere in scripture, but we're told he also has an oracle, just like Augur does. But King Lemuel's oracle isn't from him. We, we read that he has an oracle that his mother taught him. The words of Augur and the kings of, or, and the words of Lem's mom, um, both of them have an oracle. Uh, the, the Hebrew word for oracle or prophetic word is masa, which it turns out is actually also the name of a place. And so there's a number of scholars who believe that Agur and, and uh, King Lemuel are men from Masa, which would be in Arabia. Um, but even if they are not from Masa and simply have a Masa or an oracle, um, Agur is not a Hebrew name. And King Lemuel is not an Israelite king in any of the records. And so there's no doubt about it. It is widely acknowledged that the, that the Proverbs of Solomon come to a scandalous end. With the words, the wise words of two foreigners. The second foreigner passes along wisdom he got from his mother, a woman, at a time when, when women were not trusted to serve as witnesses of a crime, let alone to stand and proclaim the wisdom of God. And yet her words are included among our inspired scriptures that call us to submit our lives to them. I, I want you to think about what all this means. At some point in his life, Solomon, in all of his work as king, came across the words of Augur. And, the, and these words from, from King Lemuel's mother, and he, he recognized in them the wisdom of God. Like these, these foreigners with, with no Torah, no Moses, no prophets had somehow learned something about how the world works. They observed the fingerprints of the creator and they found an opportunity to share this wisdom with the wisest man in the world. Right, could you imagine having something that you think is interesting and being like, I'm gonna go tell the most interesting man in the world what are the, what's the likelihood he's going to be fascinated or interested in what you have to say? And yet Solomon apparently listened to them and learned from them, and he incorporated their wisdom into his own. So that the words of Agur, the king, uh, the words of King Lemuel's mom are considered the wisdom of Solomon. I just I think about how wild this is. The, the biblical te story tells us that, that kings and queens were traveling the world to sit at Solomon's feet and, and to learn from him. Solomon is supposed to be the source of God's wisdom, and yet he seems to understand that acquiring more of God's wisdom means finding it in surprising places. Contrast Solomon, with the Pharisees of Jesus' day. These were, these were men who were passionately committed to the wisdom of God that they had in their, in their scriptures, in their holy scriptures. But when the wisdom of God in the flesh, Jesus Christ was standing in front of them, they were incapable of receiving God's wisdom because they were certain that they already had it all. 
while so much of God's wisdom comes to us through uh, the ordinary channels, Holy Scripture, the Holy Spirit, inspired prophets, wise elders, much of God's wisdom also comes to us in unexpected and even unbelievable ways. I, I want to tell you um, a simple but kind of practical way that, I, that I've been trying to learn from Solomon in, in all of this. So there's a, there's a website that I have discovered uh, that I have come to really appreciate. Um, it's called allsides.com. And, and if you go to this website, um, you, you'll find a couple of features that are super useful. Um, the first thing that they do is they, they take every major source of news and they create a bias rating for the source. So they identify where it falls along the spectrum from very liberal to very conservative. And then they explain why they've labeled it the way that they have. So this is really helpful. But the second feature has to do with how they present the news. So what they do is they take the news of the week, whatever, whatever that latest news is, and they offer a summary of the event. And then also a quick take on how different sources are reporting it. And then they provide links to a report from the left and from the center and from the right. So making all sides my go-to or like first click site for news has, has done a couple of things for me. Um, first, it showed me just, I was pretty thoughtless in the sources that I had decided were trustworthy or unbiased. Um, the second thing that happened is I discovered that, that there was good evidence that some of the sources I was relying on weren't as trustworthy or as un unbiased as I wanted to believe. Uh, third, I was, I was being given now um, access to some good journalism from other sources that I probably wouldn't have found on my own. And then, and then finally, All Sides writes special features like how to identify bias in a news article so that while I'm not specifically getting informed about any like, news event, articles like this actually help improve my like, interpretive skills as I read the news for myself. So this is, this is one of the ways that I've been trying to open myself up to the wisdom of those that I wouldn't normally trust or I'm not inclined to listen to because they don't fit within my sense of who I want to listen to. But, but if I'm honest, this, this, isn't exactly, this isn't exactly the same thing as it was happening in our passage this morning but because it's unlikely that we will read a news article and declare some factual recounting of events as the wisdom of God. And there's a simple reason for this, because wisdom is not the same thing as information. Wisdom is about what we do with information. And, and I want to spend a few minutes looking at some of the real wisdom that these foreigners bring to Solomon. And I want to consider how we can draw wisdom from outside of the sources that we expect to find it and how we can receive and make sense of this wisdom. So the first thing that I want to do is I want you to notice that both Augur and Lem's mom sound a bit like, if not a lot like, Hebrew prophets. So, so um, last week was the series finale of the sitcom The Good Place. And you've heard me probably too many times, reflect on that show during sermons in the past. As this show finished up its last week, after four seasons, um, I just continue to be amazed at how often the show sounds like the biblical writers when it talks about morality. Um, the, the producer of this show, actually, and I've heard him talk about this, has explicitly said that he's not interested in anything Christian. And, and if you were to watch the show, you would find that the conclusion of the show isn't anything that we would recognize as, as Christian. And yet some of his moral instincts are so deeply rooted in the life and the story and, and the, the teachings of Jesus that I'm often taken aback. Like, ah, 
I wish this guy could see these things that he's drawn to are Jesus. This is the case with Augur and Lem's mom. See, in, in Augur, we see humility that we don't often find among God's own people. Uh, we see the humility that God is looking for in his servants. So listen to him in chapter 30, uh, verse 2. We hear him say, Surely I am too stupid to be a man. I, I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. <laughs> Who Who's ascended to heaven and come down? Who's, who's gathered the wind in his fists? <laughs> who is, who's wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established the ends of the earth? Well, what is his name? And what's his son's name? Surely you know. The earliest commentators, Christian commentators on this passage knew exactly what his name was and his son's name, Yahweh, the God of Israel, and his son, Jesus. They are the ones who can do all of these things. In Augur, though, we see the humility that allows us to keep learning and growing in wisdom. See, in, in the verses that will follow, verses 15 through 33, um, Augur is going to make some really deep, insightful observations about the natural world. Um, he's going he's gonna to draw insights from leeches, uh, wombs, uh, eagles, ants, serpents, locusts, on and on. See, Augur is an ancient scientist. He's, he's observing the, the, the natural, the world that he is a part of. And he's going to try to figure out what makes it all work. But Augur is humble about the limits of observation. See, Augur, Augur understands, I can't go up to heaven on my own. I, I certainly can't stop the wind. I, I can't control the waters which means Augur understands that there is a difference between observing and understanding what's in the world and then exercising authority over it. And Augur is quick to turn toward the one who exercises authority over it. Augur shows us the wisdom that is found in humility. But Augur's not alone. This is a humility that we find among others in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Augur goes on to show us more similarities, um, basically to repeat the wisdom of the Ten Commandments. So he says, don't slander a servant. Well, we've heard Moses say that, not to bear false witness. Uh, Augur warns about cursing your parents, just as Moses urges people to honor their parents. Augur warns against those who would devour the poor and the needy of the earth. And, and Lem's mom, she is, she's ready to get in on that action because in 31.8, she, she tells her son, she says, open your mouth for the mute. Speak for the speechless, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Who do these foreigners sound like? Moses and any other prophet that we have their text for. These foreigners sound just like the Israelites in some key ways. And, and you know, there are, there are a number of religions that Christians are often quick to criticize. But you'd be surprised how many of them share at least some, if not many, of, of our core moral convictions. Uh, one, of the, one of the most important books I think that's ever been written on youth ministry as a whole um, ha has a title uh, 
uh, has a chapter that's titled uh, Mormon Envy. And it's all about how Mormons do a pretty incredible job, at least among groups that identify as Christians, uh, an incredible job of cultivating consequential faith in their youth. In other words, cultivating the kind of faith that allows these students to grow up as adults and name their faith, name Jesus as the reason for why they are living the ways that they're living. That, that Mormons above most else are really good at this. And so this book, this chapter is called Mormon Envy. But sometimes we are so quick to reject someone who doesn't share the core of our faith. But do they offer us anything by way of God's wisdom? How often do we reject what is wise because of who it comes to us through, because of its packaging? Agur and Lem's mom, at least on some core issues, sound like any old Hebrew prophet or teacher. So, so there is this interesting sense that, that neither Augur or Lem's mom, at least so far, are adding anything new to, to Hebrew wisdom, except both have something unique to offer. In, in chapter 30, verse 8, we hear Augur say, Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. You hear, Feed me. This is a prayer that Augur is praying. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Does this sound like any other prayer that you're familiar with? Give us today our daily bread. Yeah, that's interesting, right? That Jesus, that Jesus' disciples would say, teach us how to pray. And he would essentially paraphrase this foreigner, when teaching his disciples how to pray. The scriptures have 150 prayers in the psalm book. And he takes this one line from Augur. Great and mighty, well, who knows who Augur is, right? We don't know. But it's important to note that Solomon, when you read his story in Kings and in Chronicles, um, had some food. <laughs> it's a bit of an exaggeration. That guy had serious food, more than enough food, more food than his entire kingdom needed. You read his story, there was lots of food. Israel, under kings like Solomon, often celebrated more food as a sign of God's provision. But what's interesting here is that even if Solomon didn't know how to practice it, he is incorporating this wisdom into his teaching. There's something about it that resonates with him. Even if he can't quite practice it, it is, it is just as wise to not have too much just as, as is wise to not have too little. Um, I, Americans often struggle to pray, give us today our daily bread. This is a hard prayer for us. Every time I work through the, the Lord's Prayer with, with, um, with I, I pretty much only work with Americans, but I'm just saying, like with Christians we, who are Americans, we find the same struggles why is this such a hard prayer for us? Give us today our daily bread because our cabinet, cabinets are filled with tomorrow's bread and usually also next week's bread. But what happened, what would happen if this prayer began to change what is in our cabinets? Augur brings wisdom to a people who are tempted to gather and hoard and amass more than what is necessary. It's calling them to a way of life, a wisdom lived. Okay, that's Augur. He adds something. So does Lem's mom. 
her depiction of the, the woman of valor, the woman of excellence from verses 10 to 31 in, in, in chapter uh, 31 is, is this pretty incredible, kind of epic addition to Israel's wisdom. I don't know what you, and you may not have ever, you may not even ever notice this, but if you follow along with me when you read, uh, when we read scripture in here, if you're reading out of the same translation as me, the ESV, one of the things that you'll notice is I often make interpretive decisions on the fly, such as reading brothers and sisters when the passages, uh, are to brothers and sisters. Because to be honest, I sometimes just get tired of the fact that the overwhelming bulk of the gendered language in scripture is is towards guys. And I understand that there are females that have often thought entire passages of scripture were not relevant for them because it's all to the brothers, even though the context shows it's clearly to the church. So all of that being said, here, we have this epic poem where we learn about an excellent wife or woman. I mean, she is the boss at home. She's the boss in the market. She's unstoppable at work. She's strong. She's shrewd in the good way. Uh, She's smart. She's savvy. She's strategic. She's highly respected. If you think about the stories of scripture, I mean, we get some, some short little stories, some scenes of, of some incredible women who are faithful, um, but none of them quite get a description like this. And, it, and it's important for us to recognize that this woman, in many ways, if we, if we read through it and consider what's being said, that she is not just the master of her, of her home, but that she is out buying and selling property, that she is trading. She is, she is working in the home and in the world, she, she, that there is a complexity to her. When we read this and understand it, what we, what we see, what we should see, is that she in many ways is the epitome of what the, of what the feminist movement in our culture was asking for, looking for, for women. Feminism has a lot of forms, but in its purest form, it's about women being restored to their God-given role as co-rulers alongside men in creation. That, That is it in its purest form, a restoration of women to the image of God, co rulers alongside men ruling, having dominion over the earth. In this picture of the excellent life, wife, this this woman has power. She has autonomy. She is equal with her husband. None of this requires a diminishment of the husband. The husband is still already expected to be all of the same things. But she has a dominion over her garden. This picture is, is, is... It is incredible if you consider how women are most often depicted in the stories of scripture. So we might ask, how is it that someone came along and included this picture of the excellent woman in scriptures, in the scriptures? Like how were they able to determine that this was a true picture of what God intended for women? Like how were they able to determine that this portrait was, was the wisdom of God equal to everything else in Solomon's teaching? Because most of Solomon's teaching is focused on men. I, I hope you realize how important this question is. The, the first testament doesn't contain descriptions anywhere of roles for men and women. And so there's this really practical question. How do men and women figure out how to live together and what roles to assume as we, as we do this life thing? You, you know that we deal with this every day of our lives, these exact questions. You know, the Bible says nothing about the internet. 
You, you know that, right? It doesn't tell us where to shop. It doesn't tell us how to, how to purchase ethically sourced products. The Bible doesn't tell us, it tells us we have dominion over the earth. We are caretakers of the earth as though it were a garden, but it tells us nothing about how to, how, how to care for this, this thing, this creation that God's given us. We get nothing about social media. It offers zero guidance regarding technology like cars. The Bible says nothing about modern healthcare like antibiotics surgeries that many of us have benefited from, contraception, phones, capitalism, communism, all of the isms, right? I, the list goes on and on. Things that the Bible never speaks to because it was written in a different day. And yet we claim that these texts have authority over our world and all of these things. But it is the practice of wisdom that helps us figure out how these scriptures speak authoritatively into all of these different areas. And so like, like those before us, and we have to decide what to do with all of these things, how to live wisely regarding stuff but the scriptures don't speak to directly. And often this means that, that we need to turn to other sources of wisdom, technologists, philosophers, psychologists, economists, to help us learn wisdom and practice wisdom. We need augurs and we need the moms of kings like Lemuel. But how do we draw from them? What is our basis for determining what may or may not be wise? This is one of the, the greatest challenges we face. And I want to introduce you um, in these last few moments to an idea that I found helpful. And I just want to call it the five acts of scripture. So uh, imagine with me for just a minute that you have found, you've discovered a lost play written by Shakespeare. You've uncovered it, but it's five acts long and it's missing act four. What do you do? Well, you learn acts one, two, three. You learn act five. Turns out we know that, that Shakespeare uh, follows some fairly similar patterns between his plays and so there is a sense in which we can actually figure out, if not the specific dialogue, specific lines of act four, we can actually figure out how to get from the end of act three to the beginning of act five. But that's gonna take a different set of skills than acting. It's gonna take improvisation. But you have got to know one, two, and three, and five, so deeply in your core that the language becomes natural. Because, right, you could imagine that for anybody who doesn't really know Shakespeare well, who's relying on memorizing the script, the moment you get to act four, you just can't keep up the these and the thous. So you have to be able to speak like that naturally and normally. You, that text, that way of writing, Shakespeare's language, his vocabulary, his worldview has to get into you. And then you can improvise act four. And you could do a pretty good job of it. <laughs> There's a series of movies. Um, a Mighty Wind, Waiting for Guffman, Best in Show, uh, that are basically this. Uh, the, the, the writer, director created scenes, said, this is like what has to happen in the scene. Here's who the characters are. They like understood and then each scene was improvised entirely, moving. These shows are, these movies are hilarious, but you can see that with a deep understanding of the character, of the narrative, of the overall direction of this thing, you can inhabit it and live it in a compelling way. This is what we are called to do. The scriptures come to us like this in five acts. 
The fourth act is missing. Do you know why the fourth act is missing? Because it's now. We're living it. it, it we're, write, we're writing it as we live out our lives. But, but everything we do has to align and come out of everything that's come before in the first three acts and a deep sense of what's coming in the final act. But we have to know the language. We have to know the wisdom of Solomon. We have to know the categories that God operates in as he thinks about this earth. So this is what the, the uh, anthologist, whoever drew Proverbs 31 together, whoever decided that this poem of the excellent wife belonged in scripture, all they did was start at the beginning of the story. Now, you go through Acts 1, 2, and 3, and you might be a little frustrated. You're like, where are the women? They're center stage with the men on page one, but something has happened. Well, of course it has. We know the fall. In the fall, men assumed a place that they weren't given in creation over women and began to dominate them. And this is reflected in the stories of the scriptures, especially the book of Judges, which shows just how bad this can get. But if you start from the beginning and you can imagine what it looks like for a woman to be fully alive, to be a co-ruler with, with man, to have dominion over the earth, to be a caretaker of the garden, to, to, to rule, oh, Proverbs 31 makes perfect sense. It's beautiful. Yes, this is what we aspire to and we are looking to. And so, you go, yes, this resonates with the story, the beginning and where it's moving. This is what we have to do with any wisdom we are drawing from the world. How does it connect to the story that began in Genesis and is ending in Revelation? Do you know the story well enough to improv? Or are you, are you tied to the book? Uh, do you, do you have to come back and find a, a specific passage every single time, every big decision that you're facing? Do you have to come back and find something? Or, or do you know the thing that God is doing from the very beginning until the very end? I'm going to end with this. Um, I, I got to listen to some of the, uh, the National Prayer Breakfast uh, this week. And there was a guy named Arthur Brooks who spoke, spoke so beautifully about the call to love our enemies. He just reminded those who had gathered at the, the prayer breakfast, this is what Jesus has called us to do, to love our enemies. So hard. But this is who Jesus was, and this is what we are called to do. And so when we start to improvise, when we start to live out the ethical, the moral uh, implications of our faith, are, are we living out of that command to love your enemies? Brooks was challenging those who were hearing to say, when we enter the world of politics, it's often really easy to go, yeah, 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 Jesus said that, but, but we're in politics, so it doesn't, doesn't count here. No, 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 no. We improvise. We live out the same story, whether we're in the political realm or the marketplace or our home or school, wherever we are. The, the command is the same. Our God is the same. And so, this is what we've been called to do, is to love our enemies. And there's a way that God has helped us keep that at the very center, so that we never forget, and so that everything we do is funneled through that lens. We come to this table week after week, so that we can ask the question, what is it that I'm trying to figure out? What is it that I'm trying to make sense of? How do I interact with these people in my family? How do I work with these people that I, that I have to uh, hang out with at work? How do I do this? What is the answer? What would God do? We know what God would do. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the, that's the starting point.
That's the lens. That's the, that's the, the story we get to improvise as best we can, knowing that the Spirit of God is in us, enabling us to do it. And so we'll come together again this morning to remember the story, to get Acts 1, 2, and 3, and 5 deep in us, that God created us, he made us good, but that we have rebelled. But God did not let us stay in our rebellion. He took on flesh and dwelt among us so that he might die for us, bringing us into relationship with him, bringing us back as image bearers in the world so that as he brings all of creation under his authority and makes it new, we are ready to serve and rule with him over it. There's a, there's a little place in the middle of that story that we still get to live out. Somewhere after Jesus died for us and the spirit was given and all things have been made new, somewhere in the middle there, and we get to figure out how to live in that. It's such an exciting place and time to be. And so would you come to the table this morning excited and anticipating this amazing opportunity to live out of this story?